Hello, everybody, and welcome to Nurse Converse. I am Dr. Tina Loarte Rodriguez, one of the 10 new nurse.org podcast hosts you voted for. So thank you all for this opportunity. I am extremely excited for this episode to help bring light into some areas where um, we have to have some more conversation and action. As an Afro-Latina nurse, I know the nursing profession does not reflect the beauty, the beautiful diversity within our country. Unfortunately, less than 8% of nurses identify as Latin. For Black nurses, that number is 14.5%. And then for men, it's around 12% of nurses nationwide. Yet the number of Black men nurses cannot be counted due to the small numbers. I just want to let that sit for a minute, right? There's, they're saying that they cannot count the number of Black men in nursing. So I am so humbled and proud to be able to share the platform today with these four Black male nurses. It is, it is my privilege to be able to speak with my brothers from DMPs of color, and I will start them off by having each of them give a quick introduction. We'll start with you, Dr. Michael Williams. Hey, what's up, everyone? My name is Dr. Michael Williams, a recent DMP graduate from Baylor. Uh, I have 14 years in nursing uh, in all levels. So I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Tim. Yes, it, it feels good to be here on this platform and sharing this platform with you all. My name's uh, Dr. Timothy Anserio. I am um, a graduate of University of Massachusetts, Amherst, and uh, total years of nursing experience about 18 years now. I, you know, I'm happy to be here today. Thank you. I will pass on the mic to Theo. Wow, you make me feel young there, Tim. My name is Theo Jones, a uh, family nurse practitioner. Uh, I have been in nursing for about 10 years now. I started as an LPN. All right, hey, so you up, brother? Uh, all right, Dr. Briggs, um, I am a graduate of Yale University DMP, class of 2020. Uh, I've been in nursing now for 11 years. Uh, most of my career has been in psychiatric nursing, and I am glad to be amongst my brothers again. Awesome. Thank you, fellas. Thank you for being here, and I'm looking forward to our ciphering today. So if we can just start off with a question as to what interested you in a career in nursing, what draw, drew you into nursing? Um, and I'm gonna switch up the order a little bit. So I'm gonna start with you, Dr. Briggs. Yeah, so for me, I see these guys hanging their heads. It's so funny. <laughs> That's an inside joke, but this is a very basic question and I'll keep my answer very basic and brief. Um, I started out in nursing because I, I, I saw that there was a family member of mine that had a psychiatric illness that went untreated. And so one of the things that I decided to do was instead of going to law school to be an advocate for um, juvenile justice and um, black men in the carceral system, I said, you know what, why don't I swim a little bit further upstream and think about the ways I can be a part of the solution as to why we're seeing a lot of African-American men and women ending up in the carceral system. And now the prison was becoming the de facto psychiatric hospital system. So I started nursing school because I wanted to be a part of that solution. Um, went into psychiatry again because of the lack of mental health providers and dearth of resources within the African-American community. And so that's what really piqued my interest. And so now I do a lot of advocacy work. I'm speaking a lot of places because I not only do I want to be impactful in the clinical space, but I also want to be impactful in policy and advocacy and things of that nature. So because I, I believe that the black male voice um, is oftentimes not at the table. And so we're creating spaces whereby I think that our voices are now gonna be the leading voices when it comes to black men talking about black men and black issues. And so I'm excited about that. So that's really the impetus for me coming uh, into this space. Beautiful, thank you. Dr. Tim, do you wanna go next? Yes, I just wanted to piggyback on uh, what Dr. Briggs has just said. Um, you know, however, my start uh, to nursing actually did not come out of, uh, you know, the need of here continental United States. I was overseas and uh, I went to college uh, to be a teacher. 
uh, and I was told I wanted to be a nurse, uh, but a military nurse when I was young. And this this was because um, somewhere I lost my brother, um, who is my follower, uh, to sickness. So during the, his hospital stay at the hospital, I saw the suffering. I saw how um, uh, there was this uh, shortage. However, the people who were closer uh, to us were the nurses. So I developed that kind of um, urge to become a nurse and uh, save life because I really don't like to see other people suffering. So later, you know, these are the places where you go to school, you are told what to become uh, in life. Uh, you know, however, when I moved uh, to the United States, I found out that I can pursue my goal. However, I did not know where to start, so I joined the United States Army as a combat medic where I did the work. And uh, some people uh, during that process, they really helped me grow up as a combat medic. Every time I, show up, I showed up and I showed up with the skills, they kept on asking me, Tim, why are you stopping short? You, we think you can become a very good nurse. And uh, I took their plea and I jumped into, into nursing. Then later, I thought I was just becoming a nurse uh, to become a nurse and work, and uh, it was about, oh, you can also have a, a a job anywhere you go. However, when I got into nursing, I found out that there is these disparities. The one Tina has already actually said. That's when I started thinking. I looked around to see where um, uh, people who look like me in nursing, and especially not only look like me, who are male nurses and especially black nurses. We were not many. In, in that space. Then I said, what can I do with that? I started pursuing and looking into more and more. And that's what led me to a master's degree and also led me into my doctoral degree later, you know, to sit on this space here and discuss uh, this. I'm really excited that we are here and we are amplifying the voices of black uh, male nurses in nursing. Thank you. Beautiful, Dr. Tim. Thank you for showing up yet again. I'm going to go to you next, Dale. Hey, um, so my inspiration is a little bit interesting. So I was actually in psychiatry before I decided to go back to school for nursing. So I used to be a whole therapist. Um, I was, uh, I have uh, three older brothers who inspire me every day. Um, my old, uh, one of my older brothers, um, he was uh, diagnosed with onset of uh, juvenile diabetes. He ended up losing a leg in, at 24. Um, and he uh, continues to inspire me every day, despite all of the hardships that he had. Um, he still kept coming back and fighting to, you know, continue his health. Um, another one of my older brothers, um, he actually went with me to sign up for nursing school. And he was like, you know, we should go do nursing school. And by the time the semester came, um, he was like, oh, I can't do it. I got a job. And I was like, you brought me here that left me hanging. So I ended up just doing um, nursing on my own after he he like convinced me to do this career with him. And uh, it would have been a lot more comfortable if he did it with me, because what I find was in my first like whole year, I was the only black male in my class in that program. Uh, by the time I hit my second year and a lot more students started to matriculate through, um, I met another gentleman who's actually still close, like one of my best friends to this day um, in, in nursing. Uh, he he was just like, hey, let's stick together. And we just stuck together ever since. Um, and even still, I continue through uh, my second level when I decided to go for my master's. I did that out of uh, necessity, in my opinion, because I looked around and I just said, it's not enough people, you know, that look like me at this level. And I get tired of people, you know, thinking that it can't be done. So I just went and did it and I made it look really easy. Beautiful. I love it. Well, thankfully you're not alone anymore. I'm um, never alone now. Look at these brothers. That's right. All right. Dr. Michaels, back to you. Back to you. Uh, yes, thank you. Good question, uh, Dr. Tina. Uh, I would say short answer how I got into nursing. Um, in high school, 
I always knew I wanted to be in the healthcare field. Uh, but in high school, I was kind of, I, I got that senioritis that, uh, when I'm sick of formal education, uh, bug, you would call it. And then my cousin said, you should be a nurse. And, you know, at that time, you know, you never really heard of a male nurse or anything like that. So she said, there's a lot of females. And I said, oh, all right, cool. So that's the quick, right? Quick answer, quick, short answer. But honestly, um, now being in this field so long, I'm able to uh, see how when I was about four or five years old, I actually had my great aunt pass away in front of me. And so at an early age, I had an understanding of death and how it would play a role in the lives of people. And then being first generation American, the fact that culturally, you know, as a Panamanian, there's so much I grew up about sharing and caring and taking care of others that the two the two experiences kind of merged themselves and led me to to, you know, find nursing and the love that I have for it. So and to these other brothers as well, what led me to the to advanced degree going into the DMP uh, for me as a professional at the RN level, what I felt was my voice wasn't strong enough um, and that the hospital, while it was amazing, it's an amazing place. I took care of people, you know, uh, some of our people. What was missing was that community aspect. And then I saw F&P role being that perfect marriage of, you know, I can volunteer, I can talk to the community. I can also impact change with helping health outcomes and being me in that space. So uh, that's that's kind of what led me inspired and has kept me in nursing all the time. Beautiful. And I think the commonality within all your stories is that there's this duality of kind of having family members inspire you into this journey, but then also your own realization that we need to be in these positions and these roles because there's not enough of us out there. And so I really commend um, all of you on, you know, your successes and your journeys so far. I'm going to pivot us for a little bit. Um, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Michael for talking a little bit about his Panamanian identity, because I do want to um, learn a little bit more about how your identities have impacted your nursing career, but also um, you in being advocates. Can you help me um, learn a little bit more about that? And, and Theo, I'll start this time with you. Yeah. You know, I I think that my identity has placed comfort in a lot of patients' hands and it's given me a lot more confidence to do my job. Um, I When I'm rounding in the hospital and I come in and the patient see that I'm walking in the door, the smile on their faces could light up a Christmas tree this time of the year because they're so excited to see somebody that understands the nuance of their culture that will get what they're going through. Um, and someone that can relate to things that they're talking about other than being in the hospital. Uh, I try to I try to relate to my patients a lot uh, because we're all human. I like to appeal to their humanistic side just to let them know like, hey, listen, I've been there. I've seen this. I'm on your side. Let's talk about your, your medical history. And, you know, when you get a patient comfortable, like you'll start to understand and realize a lot of the barriers that they face in their medical journey that you won't get from, you know, some of our counterparts that aren't, that, that aren't, you know, a minority or can relate to our clients uh, in this same facet. Uh, I think that honestly, you know, it's a, it's a more fulfilling track because when people of color look at the medical community, they cast a huge doubt. And, you know, when you think about the, the Tuskegee project, um, when you think about, you know, when you think about all of these like doctors going to, you know, other countries and doing these horrific experiments on these people of color. And then when people are coming behind and reading about it later on in life, they, they really start to distrust the medical system. And they just looking like, well, what you going to do to me next? What kind of, you know, crazy witch doctor pill are you going to give me now? And it's just like, it's not like that. 
I'm not here to hurt you. I'm, I'm here to help. And they don't see the olive branch. So, I mean, honestly, that that aspect of being a person of color and being able to communicate with clients on that level that, you know, like, hey, listen, I'm here with you, too. I believe that once, but not no more. This is the right way to do things. Uh, I think that really impacts uh, it impacts it heavily on, on what I do and, and how I think about things and how I do care plans with patients and even with outpatient follow up. Is is based on culturally competent uh, practice. It's not enough of that because you don't see enough of us uh, culturally competent to other people. It, it can't be those textbooks that they gave us in school because you know a lot of those textbooks were you know inaccurate. The the things that they said. Uh, I, I remember reading uh, about the evil eye and not to stare at somebody's like kid too long or. You know, or, or like black people don't like you to stare at them for too long, and, and I just remember thinking, like, man, this probably ruins so much eye contact and connecting with a patient because of this craziness that somebody wrote. And I know these people aren't black or Hispanic or you know Native American, like any of those different like minorities that wrote this book. So you know, without inclusiveness of us in healthcare, how are you making these decisions? Like, who is guiding this light, this beacon of like? The care that goes across the spectrum to everybody. So I think that would that would be my best answer for that. <laughs> that's my favorite. That's my favorite part about being able to connect with my clients. Most definitely. Thank you for that. Dr. Tim, how about yourself? How has your identity impacted your nursing career? I uh, first of all, Theo, you you kind of uh, brought it home. I felt like you kind of uh, engulfed all the thinking what we actually go it gives me it takes me back to the experience i had two weeks ago when i was doing rounds uh you know in a hospital you know i you know i cover for medical part in a, um in a in a in a psych uh, hospital but i am the medical uh, uh coverage especially for the weekend so um i i brought in a patient and i was doing a physical on on him you know um the patient did not it looked like me uh, to start with. So, you know, it was apprehensive when I brought him in, you know, however, uh, we sat in there and we started talking, you know, one talk led to the other and another talk led to the other. And then we kept on going. I, uh, we found that in one hour, the physical was supposed to take 20 minutes. It went for one hour. And because I started talking things this patient wanted to hear. Why? Because my identity has taken me through these experiences in life. There are some things I have experienced as a, pro a professional practitioner where other people I have, have not experienced. I've been, uh, I, I have an international view of things and I also have a local view and also a minority view, an immigrant view. And, you know, all these, I call it 360 degree kind of view on a patient. So with this patient, I did, um, you know, bring home what they wanted to hear. And, you know, at the end, he said, this is why I came to the hospital. And not all the things I have been doing here until you showed up today, do you work here every time? That's what he asked. I said, no, but again, next time I come around, I hope I do not find you here because if I do not find you here, it's a good thing that you healed and you left. So that kind of background, it is my background. It is my experience, which actually put me in this position to approach this patient from a point of fear to a point of being conversant, he shared with me things he did not share with the with the regular doctors who actually admitted him. And I put them in a record. I shared with my um, uh, uh, my signing, um, you know, physician, who actually you know thanked me for uh, you know bringing these things out. On another level, I just wanted to say that my identity in my community has really been the beacon of excellency in nursing it is i i can start from my own house and i can tell you a little bit uh, what i have done in my own house as i am here sitting here today my younger brother is a nurse and he followed me 
He is in the school for uh, uh, a psychiatric nurse practitioner at this moment. I have um, two sisters here who are nurses. And uh, also there is a younger brother who also is aspiring to go to nursing school at this moment. And all those, I did not say a word. They looked at me, they said, Tim, you have had success in this uh, nursing profession. We never knew that this nursing it can also be for especially a black man and also, you know, um, you know, a black man, especially in this country. I think we need to pursue that. So it is the identity. Some other times you don't even have to say a word, but the people look at your identity and they say, if you succeeded in there, I think I can be able to succeed. So in conclusion, I just wanted to say that my identity also uh, uh, some other times, not every time, and I'm going to talk to Tad when we get to those things which actually impact how I deliver care, but my identity uh, puts people at ease uh, because of that demeanor we bring, that kind of understanding, and especially if you cater for those patients who actually want relativity, who look like you, who fear the way uh, uh, Theo actually already said, who fear these systems, that these, these systems uh, can be exploitive and can also uh, not deliver the care they want because much of the care is assumed that that's what you need. Uh, thank you. I'm going to let the mic go for someone else and we will continue sharing. Beautiful, Dr. Tim. I love how now you are the inspiration for others because we know if you don't see it, you don't believe you can be it, but we're changing that. Um, so Dr. Michael, Next to you, what, how has your identity impacted your nursing career and your role as an advocate? So uh, I think my, my identity has, is, is everything in the way I deliver care, right? Um, really, everything that they told me uh, early on that would be a detriment to me in the professional world has actually been a blessing. What I mean by that is, you know, a nursing school having locks, uh, liking sneakers, uh, I struggled, I struggled uh, academically because it wasn't that um, I didn't understand materials. It was that as a first generation American, it, you have this experience of you don't speak English the way mainstream English is spoken. So when I got to college, standardized testing, I didn't do good in. But if you ask me questions and my approach and stuff, I understood it that way. So I say all that to say is when I first went into nursing, you know, you have that imposter syndrome. You have some of those uh, elements that you say, am I good enough? And what I saw was, you know, my patient metrics were doing good and things of that nature. And they were like, why do patients like you? And really it boiled down to, I grew up with a mom that told me to say hi to everybody in the room. So when I walked into the room, I didn't walk in with, that authority figure or that I'm an RN, you should know what I do. You should respect me. I walked in there with the humility of being a human and then knowing where things was and how to approach individuals. So with that, I noticed, you know, the care blossom. And as I moved on into the advanced practice, you know, working at a FQHC, which is a federally qualified health center, um, I had patients who were, you know, migrant, who were asylum seekers, you know, Spanish speaking, all, all from all walks of life. And even here in my current practice um, in HIV prevention, the biggest thing that I realized and my, my approach to care and just me in general is authenticity, right? My love for sneakers, my love for, we'll say anime, just talking about any and everything is really much is really how I bridge the gap so fast with patient connections. Because this, what we do is we have 12 hours, we have 15 minutes, 20 minutes to connect with patients. And that, that essentially is at their most vulnerable moments. So how can you expect to accomplish that when you aren't even vulnerable yourself or you present this facade of whatever it is? So I come in with every bit of what is Afro-Panamanian into a room, right? come in with every bit of who Michael is into a room. And then I say, let's collaborate, right? Because I don't got all the answers. I just can help you in what it is that you are doing. So 
I think my identity basically, you know, speaks for itself. And regard advocacy, and the last thing I want to leave off is, you know, coming from Brooklyn, New York, New Yorkers get that rep that they always are, you know, kind of like confrontational. They they speak their mind. Uh, I learned a long time ago in this profession how just you existing and existing in a way that's you. So I'm talking about sneakers. I'm talking about wearing a hat, maybe the earrings. Little pieces of you that you insert into that professional world is a form of advocacy that we take for granted. So, you know, you get your patient outcomes, but you do it in a way that's you. So, I love that. I love how you are true to yourself and bringing that authenticity to your practice and meeting the patients where they're at and also empowering them to be collaborators in their care. Kudos. All right, Dr. Briggs, take us home on this question. <laughs> that was really good. Really, really dope, Michael. Um, I think for me, one of the things that I bring to bear in my identity is making sure that I reintroduce in people to what the importance of African-American people have done for the field of nursing, because I think that that is forgotten. I think that people want to make it seem like Florence Nightingale was one of the first to do nursing and things of that nature. And we look at nursing through a very Eurocentric lens. And so when I come into the room, I'm not only coming in as an African-American male, but I'm also coming in as an individual who represents a culture that a lot of the textbooks like, like Theo talked about has not been including inclusive of our narratives. Has, I mean, I think about me being a Southerner from the South and the importance of black, my, black nurse midwives and the work that they did in the Southern states to birth babies and just the importance of that. And then for them not to be mentioned at all in our ob gyn lectures or in any of the, the books that you know people talk about delivering of, of, of babies in a safe and effective way. How else did our babies get birth if it, if it weren't for the nurse midwives and the black women that did that. And so one of the things that I always want to make sure is that I don't check my blackness at the door and I don't check my malehood at the door either. Uh, because I think that one of the things that people need to see is that nursing is not an effeminate um, career. It is a, it, it, it takes the shape of the person that is delivering that care. And so I love when I come into the room and people are making assumptions about, well, why didn't you become a doctor? Let me, let me just say this. I could have become a doctor had I wanted to be one, all right? And so I want to make sure that people understand that I have the gray matter and the wherewithal to have been anything that I wanted to be. But I chose nursing because I saw that it was a caring profession and not just I want to look at the symptoms and then I want to give you medication. And we just do this whole back and forth thing and the needle is not moving at all. And so nursing for me has meant that I can assert myself in a way that shows that I care, shows that, you know, I, I know what I'm talking about, but then also helping people to understand that nursing is not just for women, but nursing is a profession that takes on the person who actually is delivering that care. And so my sister is a nurse practitioner now. She's an FNP. Uh, she's going on to become a DNP. Um, I have nephews that are now looking at both myself and and my two nephews are looking at their mother and they're saying, okay, well, these two guys are doing things and they're doing them very well. My uncle has his own private practice now. And so what does it mean for me to want to explore, uh, to be a male nurse? And so I, I think that also in terms of research about people who you don't care about will reflect that. Like you gotta, you, you have to just not only want to tell story and look at data points, but you really want to be able to deliver care <laughs> that matters. And you also want to um, have people who are, that look like the patients that are delivering that care, right? Because we know that patient outcomes can oftentimes be predicated on the provider that is delivering that care. And so my identity as a black man, and especially in the South, and I hear you guys talk about coming in the room and black people see you and they, they their faces light up. Well, that was the case when I was in DC, but in South Carolina, it is, who are you and why are you here? And are you the tech? You know, that's what I was getting when I was in the hospital setting. I'd come in professionally addressed. You must be the case manager. No, I'm actually the provider. Um, I'm here to do a consult. I'm, I'm the consult de liaison for the hospital. And your, your, your PCP or your, your doc that was on call called me into this room because he wanted me to consult with you about your mental health. Oh, wow. And so I had to not only 
inform the patient about what was going on with them medically and mentally, but I also had to, to in, in a lot of ways, explain while I was there. And that got tired, that, that got burdensome for me really quickly. I was like, you know what? I don't have a time to be explaining to you why, why I am who I am. If you don't want this care, then you need to go somewhere else. And it, it wouldn't be a psychiatric provider within 50 miles from where they were. So I was their only option. And I would say, you know, if this is something that you're not comfortable with, then please, by all means, find another another person or another avenue by which to do this. And then, you know, they would say, okay, this guy, he knows what he's talking about. And over time that the rapport building would happen, but I wasn't spending a lot of time trying to explain why I was in that room. And so that's really the impetus for me opening up Brick Psychiatry was because I was like, I'm tired of explaining that this black man is probably one of the smartest men in the room, but you want to defer to the tech because that tech is a white girl or, you know, the person at the front desk because the front desk person is a white lady. And I'm like, this person has no idea. I, I'll tell you guys the story. I was the director of rural psychiatric services. And one of the first months on the job, somebody wanted to have a meeting in my department without me. And I'm thinking to myself, how in the world are you gonna have a department meeting about my department? And what are you gonna do with the decisions that are made? Are you gonna make them absent my influence? And so I canceled this meeting and I became the, the angry black guy in that department. <laughs> because I, 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 I said, no, you're, gonna, you're not gonna usurp my authority. I'm here because people are paying me to be in this role. And I'm here because I know what I'm doing. And so after that, they sort of acquiesced and they, they knew that they had to fall in line with the person who was in charge. But a lot of folks don't have to do that. A lot of people don't have to ins insert the, like, have to un insert themselves in that way. They don't have to go the extra mile to prove that they're worthy of being in the seat. And so there's a lot of those things that I think that as black men, we need to be black men and not Oreos. We need to be black on the inside and on the outside so that black people can really get, I think, the benefit of black men being in nursing. And to hear you say that their numbers are so few that they can't even be counted. I mean, that for me, that just kind of made me a lot more sober in my, and, and a lot more appreciative as I see Theo, you know, pounding at his heart because I'm like, wow. So we have a, we have a really lofty expectation and we have a real um, responsibility and we have to steward our profession in a way that not only helps with patient outcomes, but also leaves the door open for other people who are gonna come behind us and making our own way in nursing and, and thinking about nursing from a male context. We need to be writing about that. We need to be writing about how do we deliver care from a, from a male perspective? And what does that look like for us to change some of the ways that we're delivering care that doesn't match how men do things, right? But that's a whole conversation for a, a different podcast, but my identity is important and I don't shriek back and I don't try to dim my, my masculinity or my malehood to try to fit what has historically been viewed as a feminine or a female um, profession. So I'll stop there. Beautiful. And as you said, we could go on with another podcast on this topic alone. Um, but just to summarize, you know, the themes that I'm hearing are you know, ensuring that we're using our authentic selves to um, clear up the mistrust and the fear of our communities for healthcare, um, but also ensuring that we're demonstrating the excellence within ourselves and our profession, and then continuing continuing to like um, overcome those barriers, right? And and going into um, settings and practices and now businesses where we are providing the much needed care to our peoples so that they can benefit from what we have learned. And also Dr. Briggs, you are a doctor, you just are a nurse doctor. So don't recognize, don't forget that, okay? Exactly, exactly. And I even had to say that, and it, I'm like, I'm tired of explaining that doctor means teacher. It means to educate. And so, but people have hijacked that title and, and they've relegated nurses to just being nurses. We can't be anything else other than nurses. We can't be nurse scientists. We can't be doctors in clinical settings. We have to be a nurse. And so I'm also, in terms of that second piece of advocacy, I'm advocating for nurses in that way. So I do demand that folks call me Dr. Briggs in the clinical setting, because I want people to know that doctor is not just the MD title, but it is full 
the nurse as well. So thank you for that clarification. But I'm I'm always on that. Always. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And my my, you know, philosophy is that um, nurses and especially nurses of color belong everywhere where decisions about people are being made. So, again, I'm just really grateful to be in the community with you all and, you know, our other DMPs of color and our other um, association and networks that we have to continue to amplify our stories. So we have heard a little bit about kind of our successes as well as some of our challenges throughout the nursing journeys that you've all um, shared with us. Um, I want to ask you, what are some of the tricks or strategies that you use to navigate these challenges? And I will start with you, Dr. Tim. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Thank you so much again. Uh, and uh, Dr. Briggs, thank you for uh, bringing that other point home. Actually, that's, that, that's excellent report. I just wanted to say that to navigate through these uh, kind of challenges, which uh, we have already answered actually in our discussion. One of them is being, you know, authentic self. You know, just be, you know, authentic self when you deliver care. Yeah, uh, we, the barriers usually, like myself, I have uh, faced, and especially when the department usually sends me out of the area in a Washington DC metro area, and I go to the rural places, um, most people, they expect a different nurse. When they hear your nurse is coming or your provider is coming, and especially the role I play nowadays, they expect to see someone else other than, you know, uh, myself. And I have always uh, remained authentic. There are things which keep you authentic, then you deliver the care. And especially, to navigate around that, what Dr. Briggs said, it's okay to tell someone if they do not like, uh, you know, the services from you, it's okay to say, I do not like the services from you instead of uh, kind of like, uh, you know, telling or like you giving, accepting the services, you know, with also kind of like you are holding back, like, okay, what kind of service I'm, I'm going to receive and all that. So you just have to be authentic put it out there so that they can be able to have a choice. It's unfortunate that the world we live in or the care we provide, that we as providers do not have a say on, on what kind of care we can give. But as Dr. Briggs said, we have started to do that. We can put it out there that if you really don't like this service, you, can, you are free to seek it elsewhere. You, uh, and once you do that up front, I think people are going to be in line with you and they give you a chance to do that. They will like you again at a later time. It is um, it's, it's, it's quite when you get this rejection. You know, I have gone to take care of a patient and during the pandemic, they really needed help. In this, uh, I was deployed, you know, elsewhere, somewhere rural in uh, in, in a rural Minnesota uh, place, and uh, I was giving care. And the minute I got in there, there was this, um, you know, high school uh, 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 kids who were act acting like tech. The patient refused my care uh, from me and asked the care from the, the high school uh, girl because. Not because I was a, a male nurse. It was because I was a black male nurse. That's that's how he put it clear. So uh, to navigate around this, this is something which can uh, uh, take us down. But again, the way we come together, like the forums like this, we empower ourselves. We also authenticate ourselves that we are what the to where the titles we have, we are what to, to actually be able to deliver the care, uh, the optimum care the patients need, and they go in there, take that care with authenticity. I think that will be one way you can navigate around these uh, areas we encounter in, in providing service. Much appreciated, Dr. Tim. Dr. Michael, would you like to go next? Uh, yes, yeah, so I echo in a lot of the sentiments of Dr. Tim 
and of course everything else uh, all these uh brothers have been saying today uh for me i think two things if you are new in the profession uh, one of the ways to navigate the system really is finding that network right finding you don't need a lot you just need that one or two people maybe on your unit or in your environment that you know they they kind of do their own thing or they they are able to succeed in in this environment and build that make that your network right if you're new until you're able to develop your voice and what your practice looks like uh for the experienced uh provider for the experience at whatever level of nursing you are at for the experienced person what the best thing i say you can do uh to empower uh, more of us in the field, people of color, black male, um, is be yourself, as we've mentioned, but then also, rather than, I say, in my, in, in my career, what I've learned was, again, um, I could fight the bully, right? But when I'm not around, the bully is still the bully, and they're going to bully the people who they think they can. So I moved away from trying to fight the bully and strengthening the one that is being bullied. And it's as simple as just, you know, uh, teaching them game, teaching them approaches to their care. So building their practice. And not only that, but in normal conversations saying, I like what you do. I like how you move. I love, keep doing it, keep doing it. Until the point where they're now empowered, they now have this self-efficacy that when you're not around to fight the bully, they can fight the bully themselves. So those are my two ways, I I think, I I would say, you know, navigating these challenges in this environment. Thank you. Theo, you can go ahead. (laughs) Um, If I was to uh, give some advice um, or or just any, like, kind of shortcuts, be undeniably great at what you do. Um, Be better than everybody in the room. And if you're not, you're in the wrong room because – um, it's one thing that you cannot deny in this field is being excellent at what you do. Um, me personally, I've worked harder than everybody in the room of if most rooms that I've been in, except when I got in a room with y'all, y'all beat me down, man. You guys are amazing, but, uh, I, I think y'all competing with me, but be better than everybody in the room. Be undeniably great and offer unreasonable hospitality to the people that you are working with. Um, What I learned over the years is that when people are in the hospital, they're at the absolute worst point of their lives. And the one thing that they'll remember is how you made them feel, not what you said to them, not what script you wrote for. It'll be how how you made them feel that'll make a lasting impact. Um, As far as navigating the environment, the environments will always have landmines Yes, fight the bully, put the gloves on, get out there. Don't let these people boss you around because I, people didn't try to nurse bully me. These little five foot something women, you know, barking over their clipboards, tried to bully me at one point and I wasn't going for it. <laughs> There's no, it, it ain't happening. Ace is saying, you can't have me leave my masculinity at home. We do this. Uh, you, you forget the boy from Baltimore. The boy is from Baltimore. You're not going to listen to <laughs> be undeniably good be unreasonable with your hospitality and find your confidence early in the clinical setting because they would try to damage you finding your confidence in the field is one of the number one things that i recommend to all new grads that have ever spoken to me find your tribe even if it's just one person that you see as a mentor i ping them dm them get on linkedin you find when you identify somebody that you can talk to, because if you don't have somebody to talk to, it's going to eat you alive. Um, it, it'll and it only gets worse. It wasn't until I got through, you know, it wasn't until I got through maybe like a year and a half of nursing where I felt like, oh my god, I found my tribe. I feel comfortable here. And you know, by that time, I had already like I got callous, like I was in survival mode, like I was fighting back at everything because. You know, much like Asa, Mike, and Tim said, you know, people were looking at me like, oh, what you doing here? Why are you here? I, I can't understand why you're in the room. You know, here's my here's my dish tray. You know, here's my, you know, 
I, I don't think I need security. How are you? Why are you here? You know what I mean? Like uh, they, they, they try to attack me so much. And, you know, I hate wearing my white coat sometimes when I'm around and it gets hot. So I like to go in just, you know, regular scrubs and a stethoscope and chat with patients. And they looking at me like, yeah, here's my tray. I'm like, nah, I'm not here for that. <laughs> Find your confidence um, in the field because these people will play in your face like a basketball game. I mean, courtside. You understand? <laughs> so that that's my best advice for you for anybody trying to navigate. Yeah. Thank you. And I, and I, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. It's up to you no, now, Doctor. I, I, I will say that um, you know, all of the things that have been said is important. But then also I think one of the things that was important for me was and, and this is a challenge for, for new grads and for nurses just in general, is that finding opportunities outside of the bedside. Is in, I think was one of the most strategic moves that I could have made um, because I, I started to have conversations with people about these topics. And I was like, okay, what can we do to influence the system outside of the system? Because nurse.org is giving us an opportunity to talk about black male nursing outside of the nursing framework, if you, if you will. And so I think that, you know, uh, D DOC and, you know, uh, all of these, other auxiliary groups that are creating opportunities for us to talk about our scholarship, for us to, you know, come in and, and submit abstracts and talk about our research in ways that sometimes the institutions that we work for don't make space for us in that way. So I think that those things have been anchors for me in my profession. The other thing is, is that I made a beeline to leadership. I said, one of the things that I wanted to do early on in my career is that I wanted to learn enough about hospital and nursing infrastructure to where I could understand where the gaps were so that I could then insert myself with my expertise. And so I didn't want to just be the guy that had a lot of gripes about what wasn't going right. What I did was I looked at the organizational charts. I looked at um, delivery and, and care models. I looked at meaningful use criteria. I, I went to all of the meetings that talked about um, value-based care and all of those things. And I began to think about what did I have in my toolbox that was absent in that conversation, because then I wanted to be a value added versus here's the angry black man. Here he is showing up with his gripes with no solutions. And so one of the things that I think that we can do to challenge the system is to be a part of the solution to the problems that we're actually bringing to the fore. And so once you start having those conversations and you're not just talking about story, but then you have data to support the things that you're talking about. You know, you, you got black men. Why are we looking at GFRs in the same way that we're looking at GFRs in other ways. And so now people are, you know, black men are now, black men and women are, are up the kidney transplant list because research has, has changed the way that we think about things. Somebody had that gripe and then somebody did the homework to say, what was the solution for that? African-American men and women, PHQ-9, is the specificity and sensitivity such that we should be measuring the tools that we're using for black men, depression. How do we think about it differently? Some, we, so conversations are important only to the degree that you have the solution to that problem. All right. And so then people start to look at you as a problem solver and they can't help but bring you to the table because now you're a subject matter expert and the hospitals thrive on expertise because reimbursements are tied to that. Hospital readmission rates are tied to that. I mean, so all of these things. And so get get enough information about where you are and what you do, and then think about what you can do to add value to that organization. Because that's what we are in value-based care. That's what we are in leadership now. It's like the, the, the old guards are having to change because the way that we're doing stuff, managed care organizations are demanding different things from hospital systems. And so as we're changing, we can ride that wave now, whereas the door was closed for us. Now those opportunities are availing themselves in different ways. And as a nurse practitioner, now I'm starting to see that states are now starting to give nurse practitioners full scope and autonomy, apart from collaborative care and collaborating with physicians. Why? Because the demand, our, our research data is suggesting that patient outcomes are that of a physician, if in not some instances, better for the patients. And so now we have the data that can argue, let us be autonomous. We don't need someone looking over our shoulder. But if we don't have the data and we don't, we don't do the research and the legwork that is necessary to prove our case, people don't just appeal to heart anymore. 
You can, you, you know, people are not are gonna just appeal to black men coming to the table just because we're black men. We're coming to the table because we have something to add value to that table. And then I, I like the fact that Fannie Lou Hamer said, I'm tired of coming and putting chairs underneath your tables. We're gonna build our own. So I think that black men in nursing, we're starting to build our own tables. And we're saying, you know what? I don't want to sit at that table. I mean, because that seat comes with so many conditions and then I'm there today and you might not like something I say and then you dismiss me from the table. So I think that we're setting the table and we're setting a, a situation whereby it's like, you know what? You can bring fufu to this table. You can bring peanut soup. You can bring cassava leaf. You can bring plantain. You can bring uh, collard greens, macaroni and cheese, collard greens, and be unapologetic about what we're, what we're serving because we know that this is a table that is intentional for black men and women. And we're going to do the things that we know that are culturally competent and culturally safe and in, in ways that we want to see the patient outcomes. Because I, I, we can talk till we're blue in the face. But if another patient dies on our watch, then a podcast, why? A conference for what? Right? We, we, have, a, we have an issue right now with young African-American men and women killing themselves. That is very alarming for me. Like, so as a provider and as a clinician, I'm trying to find ways in which I can understand the dynamics of why people in my community are killing themselves. As a black man, I need to know why black men are not coming to therapy. Is, is it not enough that I'm here in the seat? You know, I said this at the conference. I said, we're building tables, but we want to make sure that we're not doing these things in vain. You know, I, I'm, I'm the black guy in this community. I'm the only African-American outpatient psychiatric provider in the county. My door is, is now people are trying to, they're knocking the door down to get in here. And now I'm having to hire people. And I'm like, okay, I want to be a part of my community and I want to be a solution, but you need to come. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to hear that somebody's killing themselves in the school system anymore. It's no, for what? Let's talk about it. And so I think that as we're having these conversations and we're showing up in real and authentic ways, brothers, you're going to attest to this. Men love authenticity and they love safety and transparency. We, we can do that all day if we know that somebody that is on the other side of that table or that conversation really cares about what we're saying. Man, we, we can have verbal diarrhea, verbal cardio all day long, but we, we just talk a lot. But people say black men don't talk. That's not true. Black people don't talk to people that they don't trust and they don't think it's safe. And so I think, brothers, we're creating a safe net. We're, we're creating a table whereby brothers can come in and eat all flats and ranch dressing and be good. And we can talk about the deleterious effects of too much consumption of fried foods. I can pass the mic to Theo, Timothy. I mean, so the list goes on and on. And we can talk about all of the things that pertain to our culture and how we're, we're doing things that impact how we, how we live and, and the longevity thereof. So I love these kinds of conversations and I want us to be real and authentic about it. And I want us to have something that we can take away of action item that changes the way that we deliver care and then the outcomes of the patients. Well, there you have it. The action items are be authentic, create safe spaces, be transparent, build and use your network, right? Like Dr. Uh, Danielle McCammon says, your network is your net worth and you are not by yourself. These are just four of the black men in nursing out there right now, trailblazing and being game changers. Um, so gentlemen, fellas, it has been a complete honor to have you on this podcast. I am so um, indebted to your um, time and your commitment and, and just you being so authentic and humbled with us and vulnerable. And so again, thank you everybody for listening. Again, I am Dr. Tina Loarte Rodriguez. This is Nurse Converse, and we hope you come back and hear again soon.